Hello everyone, welcome to Plants 3. This is the third video in the plant series. And in this video, we are gonna be talking about the functions of the vascular tissues in detail. That is the xylem and the phloem. So just to kind of recap, xylem in the plant transports water and minerals. And then phloem transports various nutrients like sucrose. So um, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is how do water and minerals get from the soil to let's say if we have a super tall tree, the tips of the canopy. And so it turns out this process is gonna rely on all of the intrinsic properties of water stemming from the polarity of water and its ability to hydrogen bond. So this process is a really good way to integrate all of everything we know about water itself. So one thing we first need to understand about water is the idea of water potential. Water potential allows us to determine where water will move. And so water potential depends on two factors, the concentration of solutes and then the hydrostatic pressure. That is the actual pressure that's kind of exerted on the fluid itself. So if you think about a container, let's say a water bottle, right? If we were to squeeze on that water bottle, we would be increasing its water potential and this water will eventually uh, reach a sufficient pressure to make the water bottle explode. And so essentially what water is doing is going from the high water potential of the water bottle to the low water potential of the area surrounding that water bottle. And now the, in terms of the concentration of solutes that affects water potential by osmosis. So recall that when we have a high concentration of solutes, our water molecules are gonna to bind to those solutes and then the effective amount of free water that's not bound to those solutes is gonna be less. And uh, higher free water is gonna to go to areas with lower free water and that's essentially the basis of osmosis. And so when we have higher concentration of solutes, we will have a lower water potential. So solutes will decrease water potential and then pressure, direct hydrostatic pressure will increase water potential. And so water potential is a function of both of these variables. And so now it turns out the movement of water from the soil into the tips of canopy is dependent on a difference in water potential. That is the water potential is much, much lower uh, as we go higher and higher up, the, up a plant and is much, much, much higher uh, at the roots. So we will talk a little bit about how this is generated. Uh, we will start at the bottom most part of the plant that is the roots and soil. So observe this diagram on the left. And what I've done here is, what I've done here is zoomed in on the roots and zoomed in on the leaves and I will make sure that the, this simple diagram is super clear. And so the first thing we need to do, right, is to get our water and nutrients from the soil into the xylem. Now, sometimes our cations might not be accessible and we might have to use processes like cation exchange by releasing CO2 and protons in the soil. But regardless, once we have accessible nutrients and then there's water not bound to the soil particles, we can absorb those water and minerals. And in terms of the path in which they get absorbed, we generally classify three different paths. One is the symplastic path, that is the water and minerals will travel by the cytoplasms of the root cells and they will move from cell to cell via plasmodesmata. And then the other path is the apoplastic path. This is the path shown here where we move along the cell walls and extracellular spaces. So we never actually enter any of the plant cells itself. And the other path is kind of a comp combination of both, it's the transcellular path. And here we enter the symplast, exit to the apoplast, enter the symplast, exit to the apoplast. So it's kind of a combination of both. And so regardless of how we absorb this water, eventually the water and minerals will reach a layer of the root called the endodermis. 
The endodermis is the innermost layer of the cortex. And you might want to review the stell of the root in both eudicots and monocots. And so these endodermal cells will have what's called a Casparian strip. This Casparian strip is a strip on the cell walls of these cells that's suberized. Suberin is going to be super duper hydrophobic. And so what effectively this Casparian strip on these endodermal cells does is that it forces the water and minerals into the symplast once they arrive at the endodermis. And you might be like, didn't we say that there are three paths? Why do we need all of them to enter the symplast at this point? Well, the reason actually is this process of forcing our water and minerals to enter the symplast is a point of regulation. So let's say the water and minerals were in the apoplast the whole time. There's no way we could really control which water and minerals we accept or really which minerals we accept and which minerals we don't accept. For example, and there might be toxins in that soil solution that we don't want to absorb, but by forcing everything to enter the cytoplasms of these cells, since these plasma membranes are selectively permeable, we can effectively limit the solutes that we don't want and absorb the solutes that we want. So this provides a nice selective filter at the last point before entering the vascular cylinder. So eventually we pass these endodermal cells and then we will be uh, entering the xylem. So now, depending if this is a gymnosperm or angiosperm or just a seedless vascular plant, we're gonna either enter the tracheids or the tracheids and vessel elements. And then um, in these tracheids or vessel elements, this water will move up, 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 up into uh, the leaves. And so actually we will skip this intermediate process uh, of the ascent of this water temporarily to talk about the process that happens in the leaves. And then we will come back to why the water is actually being pulled up. And one thing to actually make sure you understand by the end of this video is that water is pulled up, not pushed up. So once we get to the leaves and I've drawn a lot of these leaf cells, just because our stomata might be open uh, there might be water surrounding all these plant mesophyll cells in the cell walls and the extracellular spaces. This water will evaporate, right? This is called transpiration. And this water will evaporate. And then as this water evaporates and the water molecules start to disappear from the cell walls of these plant cells and then the extracellular spaces, this water has to be replaced by other water molecules that are either from other cells or from other parts of the extracellular space. So essentially, as all of these water molecules evaporate, they have to be replaced by other water molecules. And this has to do with the surface tension that is formed at the cell walls and other factors. But as you draw in water from other areas to replace this evaporated water, eventually, as you keep drawing and drawing, drawing, this pull of water will extend all the way to the xylem. And the reason why you're able to pull such a far distance is because water molecules stick to each other. We call this process cohesion, the ability of water molecules to stick to other water molecules. Um, and the fact that water molecules stick to each other allows this pull to extend into the xylem, water molecules to extend all the way down to the root, right? So essentially, as these water molecules are leaving, um, all, uh, these root absorbed water molecules will eventually replace them. Another process that's really important is the adhesion. And adhesion is the ability of water molecules to hydrogen bond with other molecules. For example, the polymers lining the cell walls of our tracheids or vessel elements, um, water molecules will be able to hydrogen bond. So I like to imagine this as, let's say, a chain of monkeys that are holding on to each other. And these monkeys are trying to pull everybody up. And at the same time, as they are in these walls, let's say maybe this is like an elevator shaft, they can hold on to slight imperfections in the wall. And then uh, with this pull by themselves, along with clawing up by the wall, uh, each one of them will eventually um, 
go through the top of the elevator shaft, or in this case, a uh, tracheid or a vessel element. So that's just a general outline of how this process of pulling the water and minerals up works. And so one thing to really keep in mind is that the water potential will be much higher at the roots compared to the tips of the canopy. And you might be like, what is ultimately responsible for pulling this water up, right? Um, certainly, since we're going against gravity, this process has to require energy. Where is this energy actually coming from? Well, it turns out to come from the sun because the sun is evaporating the, these water molecules causing the transpiration. So it's really the sun that's the originator of this energy that's gonna be used to pull all this water uh, up. So super duper cool solar powered process that is transpiration um, leading to the pull of our soil solution. Okay, so the next vascular tissue that we're gonna talk about is the phloem. The phloem serves to transport nutrients like amino acids and sucrose, and then also signaling molecules. So for simplicity, in the rest of the explanation, I'm just going to refer to the transport of sucrose. And we say that the general direction of transport is from source to sink. So where we produce sucrose and organs that consume sucrose, either for the sake of maintaining their metabolism or for the sake of storing it. And so uh, where is our sucrose going to originate? Where are our sources? Um, that would be the leaf mesophyll cells. Our leaf mesophyll cells will undergo photosynthesis and then reduce that CO2 to glucose, which will be used to synthesize sucrose. And then um, that sucrose has to somehow be transported from those leaf mesophyll cells into the sieve tube element. And this process is called phloem loading. There's generally two paths of flow loading, the apoplastic path or the symplastic path. The symplastic path is super simple. We're just making that sucrose uh, move via the plasma desmata, connecting the various cells from mesophyll cells to the sieve tube element. And then the apoplastic path is we um, move the su uh, sucrose into the apoplast. And this apoplastic sucrose will be pumped into the symplast again uh, either in the companion cell, which is this cell here, or the sieve tube element. And then um, if it was pumped into this companion cell, that sucrose would then move to the sieve tube element. And so uh, once we are at the sieve tube element, just because the increase in concentration of sucrose and other nutrients will um, lead to the osmosis of water into that sieve tube element, uh, we're going to build a lot of fluid pressure here. And it's really this fluid pressure that's going to push our sucrose down the flow, or it could be up as well. But in this picture, I'm drawing it as down. So we move down the flow just because of all the fluid pressure that's accumulated here. And um, one way to think about it is consider, um, consider a dam that's holding a bunch of water back. If we were suddenly to add a ton of water, well, that dam will be overrun. And that's just the power of a fluid, the power of a fluid to exert a ton of pressure on the walls. And then um, that will push out everything in its way, carrying whatever was in it. And the same process is going to occur here. The high fluid pressure will carry that fluid uh, down the phloem and will carry the sucrose with it. And eventually that sucrose will be unloaded at a sink. Let's say this is a storage organ. And then just because sucrose is exiting the sieve tube element, water will follow by osmosis, just like uh, in the loading process. And then the water that's remaining in that sieve tube element will be recycled by the xylem. Uh, and so one thing that's important to keep in mind is that we actually have a lot of communication between xylem and phloem. Um, stuff can move from phloem to xylem or xylem to phloem. So these are really not distinct conduits. They are um, always communicating with each other. Uh, all right, that's uh, transport by the phloem and everything that we're gonna talk about in this video. Uh, thank you so much.